So we'll get started. We'll let people kind of stream in. And then, like I said before, we'll be sending out the recording for this. Got a great panel today. We're going to start with a little bit of uh, introductions, of course. Um, and then today we haven't done a roundtable in a little longer than we normally do. Uh, we took a little break around the holidays, uh, but we're back at it for consistent revenue manager roundtables with revenue managers. We're going to be talking a little bit about what happened in the spring, how people felt that uh, kind of came together. We're going to talk about what's going on in the summer, what strategies people are doing, what people are seeing trend wise. And then we're going to talk about what people are planning for the upcoming season. So kind of late summer and fall. Uh, and we should have a pretty good, well-rounded panel. So my name is John DeRolay, if you don't know me. Uh, I'm the head of onboarding and revenue management education at Wheelhouse. A um, number of you probably have had an opportunity to work with me or see me at conferences. Look forward to chatting. Uh, and let's start with uh, you, John. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is John Ahn. Uh, I have a revenue management uh, service company called Tech Tape. And uh, we provide basically done for you revenue management, pricing management, um, essentially all around the world. Uh, so all across the US, we have a footprint in Australia, Canada, uh, Europe, and a small, tiny footprint in Asia. And so we see a little bit from all different types of markets. And so I'm, hopefully I can kind of shed light, not just on the US, but some, you know, some of the patterns that I'm seeing in some other parts of the world. Awesome. And Donna, do you want to introduce yourself? Yep, I'm Donna. I'm from the Netherlands, but live in the U.S. And I do revenue management currently for uh, summer at single family homes, mostly in upstate New York. And then we have some uh, in the Malibu area uh, and Utah as well. And then a few scattered around as well. But um, before this, I worked in the multifamily sector, so... Um, no, but a bow. Awesome. And John Malone. Hey everyone. Uh, I'm John Malone. I work with local vacation rentals. Um, I'm the director of revenue manager there. Uh, we're in Breckenridge, Park City and Lake Tahoe primarily. So ski market towns, um, Tahoe being kind of a fringe ski market town. Um, we manage about. 425 units, um, and we're located out of Denver. So looking forward to, uh, talking with her. And Michael. All right. Hey guys, I'm Michael Bilpondo. I'm one of the founders and revenue manager for Renjoy. Uh, we've got about 160 units, mostly in Colorado Springs, a few of the mountain towns around here. And then, um, some of the, along the Southern Gulf coast of Florida. Awesome. And since there are so many Johns uh, on the call, we'll make it real confusing. Uh, we'll be calling Michael John Vilpondo, and uh, we'll be calling Donna Donna John, just so uh, you can follow along with what John is talking. Um, okay, so let's kind of get into this conversation. So we're going to talk a little bit about spring this year. Uh, I know that, you know, talking to a lot of customers across the country, spring was was pretty tough for a lot of folks. Um, particularly uh, around the spring break period, although Easter was kind of interesting. I'm curious how spring went for you guys, uh, what you kind of saw, what you, first of all, what did you expect to happen based on what happened in winter? What actually came through and how did you approach that from a revenue management perspective? And for now, let's start with uh, John Malone. Yeah, so um, three different markets, kind of doing three different things. Uh, Breckenridge and Park City had pretty strong winters, and Tahoe kind of seems to be the problem child for us, um, you know, across the board. So, um, yeah, considering winter time, uh, we thought you know our shoulder months were going to be roughly the same, um, and it just seemed like you know exactly what you were saying. We experienced the same thing. Um, April, May, just we weren't getting bookings, no matter what we wanted to do. Occupancy was down, ATI was down, rep power was down. Um, you know, we just couldn't get anything to get going. So we are we are a little bit disappointed. Uh, we want a little bit more out of it. Um, but you know, you learn from that, and you know, we're going to be talking about the fall here in a little. bit. Hopefully, those lessons are going to be useful for the fall. Do you have? Because uh, you you primarily have um, ski, but do you also do lake and summer business as well uh, in your portfolio? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, Tahoe's like the primary, like the big uh, summer market. Uh, Breck does fine. Park City is pretty, um, you know, 
probably does 80% of its revenue in the winter time. So in the ski season, so it's really small, um, but you know, we're, we're trying to put a little bit more focus into Tahoe. So we got a little bit more of that, uh, continuity throughout the year. Um, so it's definitely in our forecast, but, uh, mostly just in Tahoe and you know, like, like we said, we'll talk about summer a little bit here. Yeah. And what do you think are the main kind of culprits behind the, the weakening spring this year? Um, my theory behind it, I think everyone's kind of feeling a little bit pinch in their wallet. Um, I think guests are becoming a little bit more, uh, stringent in the off season. You know, I think they're saving their money to go skiing in our markets, not going up into the show, like, you know, not as many people are working from home. Not many people want to work from home for long-term rentals um, up in the mountains. And I think, you know, people are just kind of saving it for July. December through March and you know those those shoulder months just aren't that attractive anymore so you know that's my theory behind it at least that makes sense um Michael what's going on in your portfolio for the spring what it, what have you been seeing um thanks to you we've um done a little better as we've uh still learning the the way exactly around wheelhouse but uh that's going well for Milo and I um we really we've been blessed seeing um for the units we've had online it's kind of fun always segmenting that with the growth we've had um but it's pretty much trending almost identical to last year we've pushed out our pace um farther than before which is great to push that booking window out uh taking a lot of advice from these previous round tables of not trying to get those premiums um we are long long gone from the 2021 rush so to be more realistic of setting rates um slightly higher or where you think you actually want them to get booked rather than kind of going for those moonshots um, but that's helped a bunch um this year so far so kind of trying to push that out for the rest of the year as well so you guys are seeing um pretty good performance and mainly because you think you're not holding rates so high uh you've been able to book further pace do you think the market at large is seeing performance similar to your portfolio or do you think you're kind of beating your own performance because of yeah, your and strategy yeah more on the second one just being able to beat that awesome and tell us a little bit more about the growth uh, i think that's something that people like to hear about because you know we all talk about the market but your own portfolio has grown a lot how has that changed your revenue strategy particularly what you were doing in the spring um we all love data and it's really hard when you don't have it and have your own portfolio. So just doing a lot of comps as best we can to what we've got in our portfolio. And then you've got those outliers and trying to figure out which ones you can, um, tag it along with most closely. Um, but yeah, we're, that's always the fun part is segmenting out that, um, but definitely making sure you do that. So you can compare apples to apples is always helpful. Totally. Awesome. Uh, and Donna. How, how are things going for you this spring? Yeah, so I joined um, summer in January. Um, most of our homes are in, uh, or at least then we're in upstate New York, uh, very much dependent on the ski season there um, and peak summer, but the shoulder seasons are rough. We definitely saw um, rates a lot lower than they were the previous year. Uh, but because I had seen already at my previous job, how rate sensitive everyone was getting, um, kind of combated at that, got, you know, being on the lower side of the market, especially because we have relatively high paying fees. Um, we, you know, want to make sure the average is, is right below market. Um, so we were able to get some occupancy we didn't hit our goals because they were based on historics um but we were able to get some decent occupancy uh, our booking window for the shoulder season was extremely short uh so that was new and not so fun uh but for the summer i think it's about 50 50 or you know 14 30 ish day route and then 50% of our bookings come from the one to three day window. It's a fun struggle, but yeah. 
Yeah, I've actually heard from a lot of clients uh, that they, you know, in multiple markets that they've been experiencing a lot of attrition and kind of ADR and rate, uh, and that sometimes leads to occupancy, but that they've been pretty surprised by how strong the short-term window is, not on an ADR side, but just how many bookings are coming in in the short term. I think that's something we might get into a little bit more when we talk about the summer and uh, kind of discussing how how you guys are dealing with that from a revenue management perspective, because it's it's really difficult in our space. But um, you, if you were seeing it like really early, very, very short, is it, was it, was it a growth, like a net increase in occupancy? You think, do you think the market was just getting more people and it happened to be short or were, was the booking window shifting just into the short term? Uh, I think the booking window was shifting for sure. And um, especially cause we're kind of a drive-in market. So people don't really have to plan as far out and that's, they're looking, our rates are, um, you know, affordable for that area. And then we're like, all right, let's do it. Um, I think being in a drive-in market and most of our markets are drive-in is definitely indicator of our work, pushing their short-term booking windows. Awesome. Um, and John, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in, in one or two of your markets in the spring? Yeah, I think just across the board, it's just been really volatile, right? So it hasn't been just slow or fast. There'd be like two weeks of you know, very slow activity. And then it would kind of pick up for like a week or two. And so there, there's been a lot of volatility that we noticed. And so being nimble and responding, being able to respond to those things actually seemed to help us stabilize both the spring and have, you know, a pretty good outlook for summer and hopefully for the fall. Um, speaking. So I'll talk some generalities and then talk about very specific markets. Um, in some ways, going against, similar to what Michael said, going against what the data said, right? Like the short uh, booking window, actually going against that and trying to get out ahead and capture the occupancy a little bit earlier on has been not just stabilizing, but I, I'd say about two thirds of our portfolio in different markets are at or above uh, their 2021, 2022 levels. And what the way we're, we're getting that is, you know, just being more flexible on the ADR side to capture and make sure that we're getting the occupancy. And so while some owners like freaked out that their ADR, you know, seemed to be dropping a lot lower than they wanted, right? But at the end of the month or at the end of the season, they actually made more equivalent or more revenue than they did in past years, right? So there's like spectrum that you need to kind of be playing with uh, all throughout the time when it's volatile. So I would say, you know, one market that I'm really like excited about talking about is Tucson, Arizona. It's one of those markets where everybody does talk about oversaturation, um, you know, and right now it's like the dead of summer and no one wants to go there. But in alignment with the property manager, starting in like late November, we actually typically you would hold out until like end of December, uh, and then start trying to book for February, which is the, you know, the peak, 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 uh, time. But we actually started like starting to let some bookings come in at the end of November, not, not a flood, right. But we kind of moderated it. And by doing that, we had a Pillar February that was above and beyond on a per unit basis than historical, right? So, and then right now in July, which is like the worst month of the year, um, you know, this manager is really flexible and we're able to drop the ADRs quite dramatically to keep the occupancy flowing. And again, um, in terms of RevPAR, uh, we're going to be beating 2021, 2022 summer months, right? So I think that flexibility, that nimbleness and the data is important and the data says something very important, but that's not to say that you should be following what the data says. You should, you know, kind of consider what does this mean for me and my portfolio and possibly make decisions that's against what the market is doing. And I think that's how at this point we're kind of 
again, being nimble and adjusting to make sure that, you know, properties aren't sitting empty and not making any revenue. Yeah. I like that advice a lot. Um, you know, the market is a reflection of what's going on, but as a revenue manager, you have to ask yourself if when you think the market isn't optimizing to the consumer well, or that you can do, you can beat the market by doing something different than what the market is doing, uh, well, is let, really great advice. Let me, put, let me just add one more thing, right? Cause what the market is doing is just an aggregation of everyone in the market, you know, kind of guessing and putting in their input. And that's what the market is doing. Right. And as we know, we have a hugely fragmented industry. And so what everyone, you know, all the input into that data set is what's happening, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what we should be doing. Right. You know, just, I'm not saying the data is wrong. I'm just saying, look at the data, but you have to interpret it and make decisions based on what you think will be effective. Your thesis, essentially. Totally. Um, did anyone else want to comment? on what we went around the horn. Otherwise I'll kind of move us to summer. We had pretty big gap. Spring was a long time ago. People probably want to hear what's going on now. <laughs> yeah. One tiny thing to kind of follow up on John, um, you know, rep empty units don't make money. They don't make the client money and they don't make you money. So, um, finding where that balance is and getting that unit booked is going to be very important in the long run. It also helps with listing momentum, um, which I think is super important. Um, algorithm, you know, whichever algorithm you're working on, whatever platform wants to make money just as much as you want to make money. So if you show the platform that you can make it money with that listing, it's going to promote you. You're going to get more bookings. And in the long run, I think it's going to help you at listing a lot. I'll say in order to do that, managing expectations is a huge part of being able to achieve the higher revenue performance so that they, you know, our, our partners understand, okay, you're going to be seeing some low rates, but we're not doing that just to dump rates. We're like, they're in the method to the madness, but you have to come along. And some folks will like our client in Tucson was like, all right, let's go for the ride. And some folks will, and they won't make as much money, but at least you have to manage their expectation. Because if you just do it, you're gonna you're gonna lose clients left and right. That you know they're gonna think you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Depending on how separated. We've been you're... having a lot of. Go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say we're we've been having a lot of those conversations. The world, yeah, trust us. Hey. <laughs> Wait until yeah. the end of the month, and you'll see it worked out. Yeah. I always, uh, depending on how separate you are from your owner team as a revenue manager, sometimes there's the old, uh, oops, accidentally set the rate below the owner men, but it booked <laughs> and now there's <laughs> revenue on the books. <laughs> um, I do think what you said, John, about the, uh, listing momentum is really key. I think, and especially that distribution aspect is something that, uh, I think has gotten more important. Now, when things were really good, people kind of stopped marketing, forgot a little bit about the importance of distribution. But if you stop making bookings on an OTA and there's too much supply, you're not going to show up to customers. And you really have to think about like undercutting to get that back up the list. And the way that they choose if it's up the list is if people are converting on it. And obviously you can't get a conversion if you're not getting seen. So you really have to think about like if you have a listing that's stalled out in pricing or booking and especially like, look, if you had a weak spring and you have listings that are stalled, that means they're going to stay stalled through the upcoming seasons. And that'll get worse unless you do something to try to correct that, which usually means having to give up more ADR than you might want to. But you got to bite that bullet early because it only gets worse. Um, awesome. So let's chat a little bit about summer. Uh, I'm going to make a claim here, which you can consider or just ignore. Uh, I've talked to a lot of clients this year who actually have been pretty okay with how summer's been pacing for a long time. They started rates lower this year. Um, you know, there's some acceptance or resignation about the lost ADR, but they, they haven't been as stressed, especially if they didn't have big premiums, but they were really surprised about spring. And my hunch is that a lot of markets had weaker summers last year. So they planned for lower rates, but they didn't, they didn't go back and apply that to the spring, which yet wasn't yet weak last year. Um, but it does kind of bear out that like lower premium. So I'm really curious about how you guys have approached the summer this year, what you've seen, 
uh, and just anything you think would be important to to kind of talk about. So, Donna, why don't we start with you right now? Yeah. Um, so, before I joined, we were pretty much just relying on Airbnb. Um, and as we know, that has all become a lot more competitive. So, and the supply on there is insane. Uh, so, I mean, my first thing was just to get us on more platforms. And um, obviously, the booking windows for platforms platform and the rates per platform and just the customer segmentation is different there. So, um, that has definitely helped get us some more further out looking. Um, and of course, summer as well, we made sure that our rates were lower than they were last year, for sure. Um, just to get some momentum going, also trying to list ourselves on some more furnished finder like extended stay um booking websites to get a, a little bit of base occupancy that was more the strategy there when i was in multi-family and now we're single family homes um but yeah pricing right further out like also now for winter making sure that we have our rates sitting where they're supposed to um and then yeah this summer is really where we've seen the short term window and the mid term working window kind of balance each other out, which is new for us. Um, and then playing a lot with strike through pricing and switching up, uh, you know, listing titles, listing photos. I think we've done a lot of revamping across the board just to try and kind of match summer vibe. And that has been helping us a lot. Um, we can see if we make changes like that, that we just get more clicks to get more conversion. So, uh, yeah, a lot of listings work. Do you track a lot of this distribution data internally? Like, what are you what are you looking at when to make decisions around how the health of your distribution is and and those kind of initiatives that you're doing if they're working? So, because it's all very new, I can't really make any definitive um, statements on that because we have all these like new booking boosts, and basically that's across all of the platforms. So, uh, we're seeing surprisingly. Uh, well, pick up from uh, Marriott Homes and Villas. So for anyone out there, it's a pain to get on, but once you're on, uh, it's it's pretty sweet. Um, yeah, we're just Airbnb also has been very much more difficult these days. Um, well, all of their changes, and I think they're very are becoming very host unfriendly. Um, so uh, we've seen those struggles. And I think maintaining super low status is pretty much crucial at this point, or at least getting good reviews flowing in. Um, at my previous job too, avoiding suspension uh, with representative inventory, all that fun stuff. Uh, but yeah, I forgot your initial question, John. Oh, just um, where you're going to grab the data you're using to track these. Uh, oh, yeah. You... A lot of it's internal. Um, we use Guesty and their PMS. Um, I basically just Google sheet the crap out of um, reservation. Data. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, do you use Guesty's uh, promotion capability? I'm just curious. I know that Bray brought one out. and um... We don't right now. Um, yeah. Perfect. Um, awesome, Donna. Uh, John on, do you want to go next? Tell us about summer a little bit. Yeah. Um, summer definitely we're applying the strategy, but I think big picture 21, 20, 2021, 2022, and part of 2023. I think a lot of people were just kind of had one strategy. It was like, all right, I'm going to play last man standing, last man standing across the board. You know, I'm going to play whatever strategy and they kind of went all in. I think right now, the way we're thinking about it is. Some people might call it A-B testing, but we actually call it uh, risk mitigation, right? So do a little bit of, you know, capture some occupancy at a slightly further out and, you know, 
maybe it looks like you're giving away some ADR, but in, you know, after the fact, you actually might have captured the higher ADR and play some last man standing since the booking windows are so tight. And so we're kind of distributing the strategy across. It's like, um, I think in investing, it's like a dollar cost average, right? It's that kind of an approach of like, let's use the portfolio to distribute the risk so that we're not sitting with an empty portfolio. Uh, obviously we work with some folks with one property that's very difficult to do with that. But you know, when you do have a larger portfolio, I think right now, because things are so volatile, that's to me, that's a critical way of approaching what essentially this is investment. And when you're looking at an investment, you think about risk, how do you mitigate risk? And do you want to take higher risk or lower risk? So that's how we're looking at it across individual portfolios and across all of all of the portfolios that we're working with, not only for our owners, but for our own business as well, so that we, we have a consistent stream of revenue coming in. That makes a ton of sense. I think that uh, I often think of like a portfolio as like stock portfolio where you have like kind of dividend paying strategies and then like really high bet, you know, kind of almost like venture capital investments. Um, so I think that's a great way to look at it. When you're thinking of, uh, do you have a few examples in the summer this year of something that maybe surprised you in how it has been operating or that caught you off guard? And just tell us a little bit about how you reacted to that. Um, let's see. I have, uh, <laughs> so I am, uh, helping the illustrious Brooke Fouts, uh, with his, with his personal, uh, property in, uh, in Maryland. Um, and we were killing it with getting super high ADR for the summer. Um, literally like equivalent to or better than 2020 uh you know 2022 numbers at a certain point that actually stopped that adr stopped coming and it wasn't like a huge difference in the booking window and so right now now we're playing the adr game to try to catch up right uh and so maybe we played the last man standing a little bit too late too long even though it wasn't last man i mean it was like you know a month month and a half out right so i think that's that it's one property, but it's still indicative of how volatile things are right now. And so, um, you know, right now to mitigate risk, we're trying to just get occupancy, not just throw it away, but get more occupancy to kind of recover from that slowdown. But the bookings that we do have on the books are monster bookings. So it's still possible in this, you know, in this climate, but it's like, like I said, it's up and down. Like you'll have two weeks of really strong demand and then it kind of peters away. Uh, and so like, it's like responding on a, you know, twice a week, three times a week basis is how we're at. We're able to see these shifts coming up and making the modifications to, you know, to try to, um, adjust to it. Perfect. Just to add on that as well. Yeah. We're definitely also seeing that. And I think more than ever now around holiday, I've definitely seen, I mean, it always is slower around holiday weekends or days. I think this year so far, it's been like dead around like for, for example, we didn't see any pickup or barely any pickup in that week or weekend at all. And our usually slightly higher so the ebbs are low and we're definitely feeling that and you're talking about book then on it balances dates, out. right not stayed on yeah mm -hmm. booked on date yeah perfect yeah that makes a ton of sense i I'll, after we go through everyone i want to bring up something about fourth of july this year that i kind of noticed uh but we'll kind of come back to that thank you for that donna um Michael, do you want to go next? And then John, we'll, we'll wrap around with you. Yeah. So we're just talking about the, the summer rounds we're seeing it so far. Yes. Uh, what's going on in the summer, some things you've noticed or the strategies you've been implementing and how you think they're working are all good. Good to see you question. Yeah, we've, we've, um, we've gotten better and better, especially with your guys' help with, um, kind of segmenting even more. I know I touched on this earlier, but even knowing the supply segments that are coming in, um, 
just with different regulations, the different permitting requirements, stuff like that. Like just, especially here in our main market, knowing which areas are allowed to have new short term rentals come online is predominantly in older neighborhoods with smaller units, one to three bedrooms. So like seeing those supply increases a bunch. So trying to get those, knowing that those are coming up, um, even dropping ADR a little bit on those, but trying to get the occupancy earlier where you can almost do the exact opposite with the larger units. It's so much harder to get a permit, um, for larger supply in our area. So our five, six, seven, eight bedrooms, we're pushing ADRs higher than we ever have. Just knowing that demand is continuing to rise, but the supply can't keep track just with that exact segment. So that's kind of something we've done as we've grown and our portfolio gets more diverse of different homes, uh, really trying not to use averages because you throw one going down, one going up, everything looks fine. Uh, that's been interesting to see. And it's, it stinks for my units that are all smaller, <laughs> but it's great for some of our clients that have those larger homes, seeing those big ADRs come through. Yeah. I, I think those examples of segmentation are, are really key for folks to hear because it allows you to do the same thing you would be doing, but do it more specifically. And do you have any situations where you kind of described some, but just going a little deeper where you really are using kind of different strategies for the same technique. So like different, either premium strategies or length of stay strategies based on these differences in, in the way that these segments are performing. Yeah, I'm trying to think exactly in the settings, how we'd be changing that. Um, it's more just kind of a portfolio level, how we're going to apply different discounts or try to add a little occupancy farther out. Um, yeah. Choosing when to make adjustments, uh, kind of intervene at different places yeah. in the portfolio. Yeah. That makes sense. I think we were talking last time about looking at certain segments that are trailing, like, or, you know, we, I think I remember last time we were chatting, we were really comparing your new stuff to your existing stuff and mm -hmm. just making sure that the paces were similar and talking about if there is different pacing in those, um, how we might yeah, adjust was, the rates to get them going. That was really fun to do. I didn't know we could do that in the platform of just seeing like the pacing on those. Cause you know, your, your established ones, you've got good reviews, you got really good descriptions. It's all well flushed out. It's on every platform, uh, distribution wise doing well, like with the new ones, making sure, are you getting a big boost cause it's new or are you trailing cause of lack of, if there's oversupply. I mean, I'm picking a place that already has good reviews and you're playing that risk fee game, um, with the new ones. Totally. Awesome. Um, John, do you want to let us know about what's going on in the summer for your portfolio? Um, you know, again, three different markets here three different approaches, three different seasonalities. Um, starting with Park city, uh, like I said, um, you know, 20% or 80% of your revenue is going to come through to summer through Mark roughly. Um, you know, in that market, you know, any type of, anytime you can get a long-term rental, anytime an increase comes in, you do your best to land that, um, you know, taking, you know, the average of six months over what you would do short-term renting July, for example, um, you'll take that, that reservation, um, as long as like, you've kind of, or homeowners like happy with that. But, um, when we opened our summer calendars back in December, January, um, knowing how slow Park City was and knowing how we expected things to be slow, we took a quite aggressive or conservative, um, you know, approach with summer and that really drove our occupancy there. Uh, we're having a really, you know, year over year, great, uh, year, uh, revenue per unit, rep fire, um, occupancy all up. The ADR did fall, but, um, you know, we're happy to see that total revenue number going up. Um, Breckenridge is kind of the, the middle here. Um, you know, that has a very strong Ju mid June to mid August mm -hmm. when kids are out of school, a lot of people in Denver coming up, um, you know, Summit County, you know, just hour and a half away. So, um, you know, we kind of kept things the same. We didn't really hate our summer last year. It definitely came down, but we didn't feel like it was going to bottom out or anything. So we didn't have as many long-term or long lead time reservations coming into the springtime. But when we saw those dips in April and May, um, you know, we, we kind of changed course, stayed nimble as John on was saying, and, you know, dropped our rates a bit and really drove occupancy. So Crackenridge is kind of in the middle there where, um, well, year over year, we're kind of flat. 
Um, but you know, in the you know state of the the country or just our industry, we're happy to see flap. Um, we'll take that. Um, and then lastly, Tahoe, like I said, it's the problem child um, for us. Where there is uh, we're struggling to get things going. Um, when we talk about uh, short lead times, it's it's a game of chicken, right? Um, it's a game of chicken, and it's the first one to blink. Um, you are the guest, and also the, there's a third party involved, which is your your clients and your homeowners, and they don't like playing chicken for very long. They're going to be trying to pull out really, really. Soon. So um, when we see these low occupancy numbers, we know that there's going to be reservations coming, but we don't want to miss, and you don't want, you know, your clients stuff, we don't want to miss their peak, peak, uh, peak month of the year. So um, we were, you know, seeing that, and we're, with our last minute reservations, we're getting very aggressive, trying to drive any type of occupancy we can, get any type of reservation we really can on the books, you know, within reason, you know, revenue management is a, big balancing act it's a seesaw and we can easily go over the middle of that seesaw one way or the other where you don't get bookings or you get too many um i'm not gonna rent out a you know multi-million dollar home for a hundred dollars just to get a booking but there is a balance to it so um being aggressive with our rates driving any type of occupancy getting these last minute reservations tahoe is a last minute market for us um a lot of people a lot of the tech scene comes in from san francisco and they book last minute so we hold on to that as much as we can while trying to keep our clients kind of um, calm that, you know, this is normal and the bookings will come. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm, I want to return when we talk a little bit about the fall, about what you're doing in Park City. I think that's going to be really relevant for a lot of markets that are moving into their shoulder and low. But for right now, um, the short booking window is really interesting to me because that that seesaw you described is so difficult to navigate for the revenue manager. We did a roundtable last month uh even though we didn't like advertise in the united states it was really for an australian client it was really interesting what they were talking about if anyone wants to go back and listen it is uh, uh it will be uploaded it's really good but they were all talking about holding their rates and even raising a little in the short term because you know they are in a low season but they were finding that that short-term window lowering the rates was just eroding their revenue it wasn't changing their occupancy positions I'm wondering if anyone has been experimenting with any rate raising, any segments of their portfolio in response to the short term window. Like you said, obviously the owners are going to be resistant to that if things are down, but do you have any places where you think that would work or has worked, or is that something you've been considering? Um, John, let's go back to you and then we'll kind of go back around. Yep. Yeah, um, you know, when we acquired the company on Tile, the prior uh, owners actually did that and we were very hesitant to it. Um, they were obviously we bought where we acquired them in late 2022, I believe. So, you know, they, you know, sold at the top, good for them. Um, but, uh, um, I, I don't know. I think with our portfolio size, it's very hard to do that and not, uh, make mistakes and potentially lose out on money. I think, you know, in the game of revenue management, it's, you know, the risk and reward. It's, um, you know, maybe taking that a little bit more conservative approach across the board is going to be better for us as a whole and for the individual client as well. Um, you know, in case we do miss on any client, um, you know, that, that, you know, one, one angry client can, you know, speak for 10. So, um, we try to min uh, minimize that as much as possible. So raising rates might get a little bit risky for us, um, across the board. Um, Awesome. You have great idioms, by the way. <laughs> Anyone else want to chime in on this? I'm, I'm pretty curious about that, uh, this concept of, of like that volatility in the short term. Is there any position to hold or raise? Are you willing to try it? That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, we've actually been uh, experience, experimenting with it now. Um, we'll see a little uh, like we did over 4th of July weekend and, um, uh, in spring, we would have probably done rates or, you know, really try to push for the rest of this month by lowering rates. And this time for weekends, especially we've been trying to hold rates a little bit longer. Um, if we know the booking window is so short, but instead of panicking a week out, well, you know, we'll hold it until Thursday before we start tanking. Uh, we've seen some 
success with it. It really also depends on the size. I think it's been working better for our, um, let me back there myself before I say it, um, for our smaller units, it's been a better result than for our larger homes, but that's to be expected. And um, we're more planning involved with traveling with larger groups. So, um, yeah, we've been experimenting, seeing some success, but very early in the stages of uh, trying to figure out where that sweet point is. 100%. It, it's interesting you say it was in Australia because uh, the one client that we're working with is in Australia. And I think uh, relative to this conversation, um, and for us, it's there's there's a property that for a while, it was kind of shadow banned on Airbnb, like no one could find it, but it was actually live, right? And that's actually been happening. That that actually happened to a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of folks. But um, so it, it's had problems in the past, but it's at a point where like, it's so low, that one singular property that it's like, let's give, let's try raising rates, you know? And so it's more like, uh, there's nothing to lose because like nothing's happening. Uh, and, and then, so with that, we're experimenting with, uh, with it, but yeah, we're very hesitant to play chicken with, uh, last minute because, you know, like, you know, when you have a rotting banana, you can make banana bread. Right. But when you miss that night, you can't go back and make banana bread out of a unoccupied night right so um yeah yeah so john wants to have the best idiom title <laughs> battle of the johns <laughs> uh, oh no so but that's yeah uh we're we're very sh hesitant to play that game because um uh, a lot is at risk yeah definitely definitely understand that i think and it goes back to that risk management piece right like uh, i do find that a behavior that's consistent among revenue managers and PMs is the larger your portfolio gets, the more conservative you have to be because you just can't afford to to kind of skip that beat. Um, Michael, how is this working for you? I know like you have a pretty short booking window all the time. You have a lot of smaller units. Uh, I know that we've talked a little bit about in different segments, you know, how you hold or raise that rate. What have you been doing to kind of experiment with that and how are you feeling it? It's going. I love all the idioms and it, it's, um, I find it hard to actually be able to be confident either way, whether you're going to hold or drop, especially with that short, that short term. I mean, you just have so little data, um, find myself reverting back to just old school, open up an incognito tab and go check, like how many are available? Like, can I hold, am I already at the top is dropping rate going to move me up the search ranking on any of the platforms or am I already first page near the top, there's not much left, hold it. Like, I don't know how to do that any way besides that manual way. If, if there was an automatic way, that would be awesome. Get some AI in there, figure something out, John, for us on the wheelhouse side. But, uh, that's kind of the only time where confident either holding or even raising a little bit is when you know there's a compression. It's just, we haven't seen a lot of that in the last couple of years. But that was a really fun game to play a few years ago. Yeah. I, I think that tip is really good. Um, there are some ways you can approach that through market data by kind of looking at occupancy of sets, but really just getting back to the basics and saying like, am I on the first page already? Because that's what you're trying to do by lowering the rate. You're trying to bump yourself up in visibility so that you have a chance of getting that booking. If you're already there, that, you know, and finding what listings are already there is a way to kind of determine maybe which properties that you can segment into that you might try holding and see if that is successful rather than just cutting. I think that's really good advice. Um, one other thing that I think uh, I wanted to mention, I heard the shadow banning uh, from John on really interesting. We, if you don't know, Airbnb is punishing listings for like review scores and, and feedback from customers by like taking your listing down for short periods of time. They're not always telling you but they're kind of adopting like that Expedia approach to like smack you if you're not doing what they want you to do. 
Uh, something that Doug Truett at Romy does that I think is a really valuable thing for folks to do is there is a way to identify if you're kind of being punished on the front end. And if you go to that listing, it will it, the Airbnb app will tell you it can't find it, right? It'll say this listing can't be found, right? Um, he just bought a really cheap scraper. There's a bunch of tools online that you can just program a scraper in with URLs. And it's like they're pretty low cost. And he just once a day has it scrape all the listings. He doesn't scrape any data off them. He just has it go to the page and it tells him if the page isn't there. So he knows if listings are down and he can go adjust the revenue management on those because he knows that that listing isn't going to get bookings for a few days. Um, and Michael, actually, that's a good point. I know you had some issues with uh, distribution recently. What did you do when you had those issues uh, from a revenue management perspective? Speaking of what yeah. That was fun. Um, an entire week where, you know, Airbnb just, you just vanished from there. Um, we kind of went old school. It was straight to quick email blast, uh, doing promotions on the other distribution channels. Um, thankfully it was peak season. So we were kind of experiencing compression anyway. So if you're able to be found, whether direct or the other channels, you, we still had a strong week. Um, thank goodness we ended up being flat year over year on that, but, um, it kind of does reopen your eyes to what, where your distribution is coming from. Looking at key data, I'm often using that, um, market report, seeing where, how much revenue is coming from each platform. It almost comes back to more like risk management of, it might not help our, with our ADRs or rev par total revenue for our owners or for the company, but uh, I don't know. It's like not urgent, but important to, to try to diversify that. Yeah. Awesome. So we're getting a little short on time, so let's jump into what's going on in the future for this one. Um, I'm going to start out with a direct question to John about what he was doing in Park City. I think that's going to be relevant to folks. But then as we go around the horn, just talk about what your kind of expectations are coming into the next season. And if there's anything that, you're, you know, what your approach is going to be as you uh, as we go into the next season for you. And tell the listeners just kind of if that season is going to be higher, lower, shoulder, whatever, just so they're aware. Uh, but for you, John, you mentioned in Park City that um, you really drove a lot of long term business. You kind of calculated what you need. Uh, I think that's really going to be helpful for folks who are going into a shoulder or low season. So just telling us a little bit about what you did and also particularly like what, how are you calculating what to offer for those long terms? I thought you mentioned that. I thought it was really interesting. I think people might want to hear it. Um, all right. So uh, first thing that what we're doing, um, you know, I think what we did in Park City was you know, looked at what we got year over year, what we got for our individual reservations and, um, you know, didn't shoot for above that. Um, we would be happy if that got booked, you know, six months out at the same exact rate as what we got last year. Um, and we wouldn't complain about it at all. Um, we also tried to drive some longer reservations, so dropping our, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, I think that's going to be pretty critical in our shoulder months. Um, as the, our shoulder months for each of our markets is going to be here fall and spring. Um, right after peep see, uh, leaf peeping season, it gets really, really slow in Breckenridge. So um, right up and through October, we got, or like mid-October, late September, you got some decent demand coming in, but it's still very competitive for those limited reservations. So, um, you know, if you can drag out a four or five night stay in October, you're going to be happy with almost any reservation that comes in. Um, so, and you're also going to probably be happy with the Monday, Tuesday reservation that's booked at a really low rate. Cause then you can go get Thursday, Friday, Saturday booked. So, um, trying to draw out those longer reservations with a longer lead time is then, uh, you know, one of those methods. Um, but also allowing shorter reservations to book at a little bit more of a premium for those Thursday, Friday, Saturdays. Um, you know, we hold a four night minimum, like for us, like pretty far out, but, um, that will be dropping, you know, here very shortly to three nights, uh, try to drive a little bit, you know, just being more lax, um, more lax with, uh, you know, what guests have to go through to get a booking. Um, and really allowing them to, you know, have the easiest way to book, um, during those, you know, more competitive times for reservations. Um, you know, long terms, um, the, 
usually the guess is going to drive the price. Um, they'll, you know, they'll give us a budget and we'll see if that works for us. If, uh, someone in Park City wants to book from May to November and they're going to offer, you know, three grand a night for a two bed, you know, you go to your client and say, what well, would you go to a city that's like pretty decent rent for an apartment? You should let them probably take that. Um, you know, you might get five grand, six grand in July, but you know, three times six is day 18 and you're not going to get anything in May, September, October. So, uh, we have a lot of data. We can look at what a two bedroom normally gets during that time. And, um, you know, if we can get more than what the short term rental market's going to you know, give us, then we'll go to our homeowners and say, this is good for you. Um, as long as you don't have plans to come up with the kids, like you should probably let this go to the guest. Awesome. Do you telegraph that you do that kind of negotiation to the guest in any way, or, or do some guests just reach out and those that's the pool of leads? I'm sorry, what was that? Do you telegraph or advertise that you do that kind of conversation with guests or like do that kind of business, or is it just that some guests are just asking and you, you just consider them? Um, well, first, like when it comes to our homeowners, we, we like you know, giving them the option if they even want to be like in the program. Some say yes, some say no, and some say they want approval is kind of how we break it down. Um, and then we use like max night restrictions and, you know, inc like, can you inquire for longer stays than your max nights? And that kind of breaks it down a little bit. We don't do anything outside of, um, you know, marketing, like maybe some direct mailers for long-term guests. Um, you know, it's, we, we explored going on to Zillow on apartments.com, but it's pretty difficult for our scale. And it's also, you know, tough to do without a licensed realtor uh, on those websites. So, uh, without the approval and like the homeowner setting up the listing themselves, it's really difficult for you to actually get on those platforms and advertise. So we do, um, monthly discounts, you know, ramp them up a little bit. Um, it's a little bit sketchy because you don't, with our, uh, ski season calendars open, we don't want someone taking a big discount on a month, two month long stay in the ski season, but, um, you know, up, up in your, um, monthly discounts, just a little bit. So people might get attracted by that. And then, yeah, they usually will inquire and say, you know, this is my budget. Uh, what can you do? And that's when we'll just, you know, look at the data and say, you know, that works for us. Come on in. Awesome. Um, Michael, do you want to go next about what's coming up for you in the fall? Yeah. And just touching on what John kind of left off on and what you, John, have um, even showed me was check with your PMS. If you can do the monthly discounts by season, um, I didn't know that was possible in the PMF. I've always just used the dynamic pricing tool as like where I'm doing almost everything for revenue management. So that was really cool to be able to add that monthly discount higher in the off season. But you really, I, I've always done that manually and you'd always be like, oh shoot, have I done that yet? Now it's like, okay, only for the low season does this monthly discount apply where, you know, you bump it up you know, from 20 or 20%, 25%, 30, something like that. What PMS are you using uh, for folks that where you can do that? Uh, we're using Guesty. Perfect. Well, we'll shout Guesty out and hopefully they'll send us, send me like some cookies or something. There you go. Or an awesome. ideal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Send me some stock. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Keep I going. really liked what, what John also said about, you know, instead of just dropping um, shoulder season mm -hmm. or even off season across the board, doing it on the weekdays. I made a note of that. That's, that's a great point there. Um, but what was the question again? Just what so, you think is going to be what, what your expectations are for the fall uh, oh, coming yeah. into the next season. I know we've talked a few times. I think it's been mentioned on a couple of the last um, round tables as well. I think it was Heather talking about um, the trends with different school schedules moving. Um, like 30% of our guests come from Texas. They drive up here to escape the heat. Um, go see the mountains. So just knowing that, like, uh, I think I saw 94% of students return to school between August 7th and 18th, which has moved up quite a bit since over the last couple of years where a lot of it was late August or after Labor Day. So trying to prepare for that and kind of make some shifts there, um, drop ADR a bit and grab some occupancy for August if we're expecting it to be that the peak season seems to get a little sh shorter for us. That is a great point. A lot of, I've been hearing about this from a lot of folks in the South. So if you've got Southern 
vacation rentals. Uh, check your school start seasons. A bunch of those, like I know all across Florida, they moved up to the first week of August and that just cuts your summer down by, you know, anywhere from 15 to 30%. Uh, yeah. and, your and that was kind of what we heard from uh, a lot of the spring break earlier this year as well. Yeah. Really fast. People got lucky with Easter kind of tagging it right at the end of there, but not noticing that could get you in trouble. Totally. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Uh, John on, do you want to go next? And then Donna, you'll finish this out for today. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll use the Tucson portfolio again as an example. Um, we're seeing general occupancy pacing uh, more or less in line with what we saw last year uh, for that for that portfolio. And so right now, um, that's indicative that we can utilize a similar strategy, similar booking window and everything. Uh, and so we're not switching strategies, you know, too much on that portfolio, right? So we have good indicate, we're still trying to stay nimble, but we have good indication that you know, the rest of the year should play out very similar to last year, just by from the occupancy pacing that we're seeing right now. Um, so that's kind of the approach that we use. Um, you know, some markets, we, if it's just, just one property, again, that that's a little harder to use that kind of an approach. But as an overall outlook right now, um, I actually think uh, across the U.S., uh, performance end of 2024 should be similar or stronger than 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 last year is kind of you know it's partly my own optimism of what what i'm seeing uh so it's not fully data driven but that's kind of the outlook that that i'm seeing and then of course i i get influenced by um things that jamie lane and uh brand say when they talk about like you know the economic outlook and you know they're pointing to factors outside of just the short-term rental economics right the macroeconomic factors and that seems to kind of support um that viewpoint does that answer your question yes it does thank you john all right so take us away donna john <laughs> <laughs> donna john um yeah i think what we've been trying to do is uh really use platform market um platform specific marketing um for the fall as well so we'll set up real sets on airbnb um to kind of it's honestly these days all about perceived value almost more than actual value because they see that strike for when it's great they're like wow getting a five dollar a night place for 250 and i'm like mm. sure there um but we are seeing that that has a big um influence so we're really trying to utilize those to show the strike through pricing to get people on board um but for further out as well and where we used to have longer minimum length of stays further out we're kind of shortening that and you know we can always adjust and become more stricter if we get some base occupancy on the books but um for us it's more about being lenient further ahead of time um and uh, trying to get something in decent rates uh, without being too restrictive too far out and that's our strategy for fall here awesome perfect guys well it looks like we're right on time really appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation with y'all um and look forward to having you on the next round table uh we'll probably be doing this in another four to six weeks so we'll be back on schedule for consistent ones and we'll be probably talking about everyone's uh optimism and woes for labor day <laughs> uh hopefully thanks, we all have a day off on that day thanks everyone for your time and thanks for everyone for coming and listening uh and you know hope the rest of the summer goes great for y'all